I hope you're having a lovely day. You're listening to Tech Fest Talks, a podcast by students for students. My name is Arushi Rastogi. I'm 17 years old and I go to Cults Academy. Today, I am thrilled to interview former competitive Scottish swimmer Hannah Miley to, to learn about her swimming career and what it was like to represent Great Britain in the Olympics. So, hello, Hannah. How are you today? Hi, Arushi. I'm very well, thank you. And thanks for having me on, on your podcast. So before we begin, would you like to just introduce yourself? Uh, yes, so my name is Hannah Miley. I am a 32-year-old swimmer, recently retired, um, triple Olympian and double Commonwealth champion. And yep, I splashed around for a living. <laughs> wow. So for my first question, what made you decide to go into competitive swimming? Um, it kind of started when I was very young. My dad was the first person to teach me how to swim uh, purely from a safety point of view, making sure that as a young child, I was confident and safe around water, did council lessons and went through all the sort of usual steps of a kid kind of going through the Learn to Swim program. And I found when I was younger, I was just very, very competitive. Um, and swimming was a great way. I love the competitions. I love the fact you had your own lane. You get to go head to head with other swimmers. And it just kind of really instilled that drive and competitiveness. And just from there, I had other activities that I did, tried a bit of running, a bit of athletics, um, played the piano for a little bit, uh, tried a bit of netball. But over the years, I just kind of found I was just better coordinated and I felt more at home in, in water. So I kind of enjoyed sticking to the training and then the competitions. And I realized that I wasn't too bad at it. So, you know, each time that I made a team or you know got a progression through my time, I would look at what the next goal was. And it just naturally kind of came about that I was just get, going through the ranks and reaching higher and higher up the ladder of competitive swimming. Um, so it wasn't really a, a decision as to this is exactly what I want to do. I want to be an Olympian. It, it kind of evolved over a, a couple of years and um, learned a lot about myself and how flat footed I am. <laughs> so being flat footed on land is not great, especially for running. But in the water, it means I've got uh, incredible fins for feet. So it definitely gave me that advantage. So did you always have a dream to kind of represent the country at an international level? It kind of came about when I was maybe about 10 or 11. I remember sitting down watching the uh, Olympic Games, the Sydney Olympics in 2000 um, and just being really inspired, watching how effortless it looked on the TV. The bigger swimmers just made it look so smooth and so fast and elegant. And, um, you know, watching the GB team compete, you know, you're always getting behind them and supporting I just thought, you know, it'd be awesome to be there. And I remember we used to write uh, like a logbook. So we kept note of what we were doing in our training sessions. And at the front, we had to write our goals, our short term, midterm and our long term goals. And for my long term goal, I wrote down, I'd like to get to the Olympic Games and stand on a podium brackets with a, preferably with a gold medal around my neck, close bracket. Um, so I was quite specific, but I think it was one of those things that I wrote down because you know, I thought most swimmers would write that down. I never really fully believed it, but it wasn't until I kept committed to swimming, I kept enjoying it, found that I was progressing, that I realized that dream was, you know, becoming more and more of a reality. And I qualified for my first Commonwealth Games team in 2006 when I was uh, 17, uh, sorry, 16, uh, going on to 17. And that really gave me that sort of buzz and decision that, you know what, I would love to compete for Great Britain. I've competed for Scotland. I want to take it to the next level. Um, so, yeah, so it just kind of, again, it just evolves over time. That's so amazing to hear. I know lots of people are around the area do lots of swimming and there are quite a lot of competitive swimming clubs around. So I do think that there are quite many people who do have sort of similar aspirations to you know, represent the country at the Olympics. So that's great to hear how you got interested. So as you were mentioning earlier on, you participated in so many competitions and as you mentioned, even at the Olympics three times. So what did you feel it was like to represent Great Britain on this international platform? It was a huge honour being able to put on a tracksuit and have the British flag, Team GB, across like the front of your chest and across your back as well. Um, and it wasn't so much the kit, it was um, like your swimming hat. Your swimming hat had GBR. And there was just something really quite proud in that moment, being able to put on the cap. And especially with it being an Olympic hat as well, 
Um, it was really, really cool. <laughs> um, I can't really describe it in any other way other than it was very, very cool. And yeah, being able to stand up and you know know that when you're on the blocks and you're about to swim, you're not only doing it for yourself, but you're doing it for your teammates, your family, and to do it for GB. Um, you know, you do take a sense of pride in that. Uh, and, you know, it kind of makes it all worthwhile that, yes, sometimes swimmers, it's a bit of a selfish sport. You know, you have to look after yourself, your training, your food, your sleep, everything centered around getting that peak performance. But when you're there representing the team, you're not only representing yourself, you're representing your country. So you uphold the values of that country, you know, making sure you stay competitive, but good sportsmanship. Um, you know, making sure that you're giving it your all, you're honest. So, yeah, it really helps define the values of who you are as an individual, as well as being involved in such an awesome team. And you get to meet some incredible teammates, too. Um, you know, I've made some great friends on the Olympic teams, and that for me is really, really invaluable. Uh, I learn a lot, an awful lot from my teammates and my friends around me. Wow. So I think cool is a brilliant way to describe it. And I think lots of people, when they look at you and your achievements, also think that it's quite cool what you've managed to do. Um, so were your preparations for the Olympics any different to your preparations for other competitions that you participated in? Yeah. So when you want to try and target an Olympics, you uh, go through what's called a, a quad cycle, so a four-year cycle. The Olympics happens once every four years, so it's not as frequent as some of the other competitions. So when you're making the plans with your coach, it's keeping in mind of the buildup. Um, so we have three things that we look at. We have our physiology, our technique and our psychology. So straight off the back after an Olympic Games, that's pretty much year one. So there you're looking at building your foundation. So looking at your physiology, making sure you're getting good training in, expose yourself to lots of different types of races, learn where you're needing you know, technical uh, improvements on. Um, and you just kind of like learn and develop. So it's pretty much setting the groundwork and building up the foundations. Year two and year three is all about refinement, looking at the technique. You've got that base of foundation through good physiology, working a little bit on your psychology, your mental preparation too. But the most important thing compared to, I guess, I mean, any other competition, the Olympics are, yes, the Olympics are incredible and it is once every four years, but if you really think about it, it's no different to any other competition. The pool is exactly the same. It's a 10 lane, 50 meter pool. You're up against, you know, the best swimmers in the world or your best swimmers in Europe or the best swimmers in the Commonwealth Games. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to compete at world championships. The world championships and the Olympics are similar in a sense that you are up against the world. Uh, the thing with the Olympics is that it has the Olympic motto and the Olympic values added and maybe the odd one or two extra people watching. <laughs> um, so there's a lot more hype around the Olympics. So the psychology build is so key um, because there is a lot of pressure on, on it. You know, you've got this one shot and you've worked hard for the four years leading up to it. And it's really important to make sure that you don't overstress about it you know it is just another competition i remember standing uh, on poolside in the uh, water cube at the beijing olympics in 2008 and one of the swimmers came up and <laughs> i'll never forget it she just looked and she was like all oh, right a this is a, a right big gala in it um very apologetic for my um, <laughs> yorkshire accent impression there but you know it was true it is just another competition if you try and view it in that mindset yes it is spectacular and there's loads of little things about it that do make it so much more special compared to the other competitions. But if you really break down the distractions and the little sort of fun flares that the Olympics has, it's no different to any other competition that you've been to. So, you know, the psychological preparation is so key because it can be very easy to get caught up in the hype, the buzz. And over the last couple of years of watching how the Olympics have grown and developed, social media has been great at advertising and promoting athlete profiles. But that comes with a lot of pressure. So it's important that athletes can go in feeling more robust and being able to, you know, you're there to perform, you're there to, um, you know, do a task of compete and try not take on some of the stories that might be happening online or the trolls that might be trying to put you down. And, you know, it's really, really important to try and protect yourself. So there's a lot going on training wise to be an Olympian other than just what you do in a swimming pool or on a track or whatever sport you're into. So the psychology side of it, I think, is really more key now than it ever has been. Um, 
And I think as well, using your experiences. So even if you don't have a good experience in a competition is not shying away from it. Use it as a learning curve. Um, and also positive talk. Um, a lot of people, sometimes we feel we're not good enough for things. And, you know, making a team, we all of a sudden panic and think, why am I here? I'm not going to be good enough. Can I make a medal? Positive self-talk is so important. And it's not just for an Olympic Games. It can be for anything, any, you know, whether you're going for a job interview or whether you're applying for something and you have to speak, you know, you are good enough. You're in this position where you have an opportunity. And it's really important that you, you know, you make the most of it. So, um, yeah, I keep going around in circles with what I'm saying here, but it definitely the psychological work you have to do for it is so so important um yeah you're gonna have your tough moments you're gonna have moments where you're gonna feel great but it's you know it's all part and parcel of being an elite athlete you're gonna ride with it and grow and develop with it too yeah so it sounds like there is a lot of dedication involved in this process and what you say about keeping a positive outlook is so important as you mentioned for anything so that's very nice to hear from you um, about two years ago, you suffered from a muscle tear in your shoulder. So how did you decide to kind of go through with surgery? And then how did you deal with the effects that that had in your performance afterwards? That was actually a really tough time for me. And, uh, you know, I kind of have to listen to what I've just said to myself there about the psychological input, because it really did affect me mentally. I knew that there was something wrong with my shoulder. I wasn't able to perform the way that I wanted to. I was in constant pain. Um, had lots of scans done. They all kept coming back saying that I was fine. There was nothing wrong, but I knew my body and I knew that there's something wasn't quite right and ended up getting a second opinion. And this was all happening during COVID as well. So it wasn't easy to get a hold of, uh, the answers to sort of help alleviate some of the stresses that I was thinking. Um, but luckily I managed to, and yeah, the doctor told me you've got quite a significant tear in one of your muscles and quite a really tricky muscle to tear as well so I'm not 100% sure how it's managed you know I've swam for so many years it could be a, an element of wear and tear and just you know everything aligning up at this one particular moment and it's just kind of torn a little bit more but he did say look back at some of my scans from I think it was like back in 2018 and he said that the tear was actually there but it was very very small and they'd missed it so it was kind of hit with a a lot of emotions. Uh, first one was relief. Um, the the fact that I had an answer and, you know, the fact that I wasn't making it up and, you know, there genuinely was something wrong with my body. So I did, you know, prove to myself that I knew what my body was going through and I just had to be strong enough to hopefully find that one person who would listen. Um, uh, but the other part of it was actually complete and utter devastation too, because, you know, I was really wanting to aim for a fourth Olympic Games and go to Tokyo. And this surgery would have definitely ruled me out because it takes about a year for the recovery process to happen. And I couldn't get the surgery done until October 2020. And the Olympics well, qualification was in April 2021. So that only gave me about six months to try and get through rehab and recovered what you know, the doctor said would take a year. So I knew I was very realistic in my sort of mindset of being like, right, OK, the chances of me making this Olympic team is going to be very slim. But I could still use it as a motivation. I could see, you know, well, let's see how close I could get to the qualifying time. Let's try and use it as a, a source of motivation to keep me going through my rehab. So whilst it was um, very challenging emotionally uh, going through any sort of rehab, you've got progress. progress and I feel as athletes, we're very impatient. <laughs> um, we just want to be better right away. And we want to be back to exactly where we were before. But Sometimes it takes just that little bit of time. So I had to learn to be patient and appreciate the little improvements. So when you suddenly think, oh, I should be able to manage this. Oh, I can't do it. I can't lift my arm up above my head. But actually, I tried to document as much as I could so that I could always reflect back and see how far actually my progress had made. And I realized it was progressing really nicely and a lot faster than what the doctors had thought. So, yeah, it is very much a big roller coaster of emotions. You can feel really happy and elated when you achieve a little bit more progress. But then with progress, sometimes you do get a bit of regression as well. And that was always frustrating because you panic and you think, oh, no, why is it not working the way that I want to? So being able to kind of ride out those moments of regression and sometimes it's your body telling you to just stop and rest or you need a bit more recovery or take time. Um, so 
yeah, it was very, very difficult, but it did teach me a lot of things. And uh, we not long had our first dog as well. Um, she was coming up for a year by the time that I had the surgery done. So I kind of used her as a really nice distraction, um, got teaching her different tricks and she helped me through rehab because, you know, I wanted to be able to pick her back up. I want to be able to hold on to a lead. And, you know, if she runs away, it's not going to pull my arm out the socket. So I had a lot of determination and drive and reasoning for making sure I got this rehab right, because if I didn't get it right, it was going to take longer to heal. So I had to listen to what the doctors were saying, listen to what my body was saying and yeah, just find different ways to keep my head distracted and uh, keep positive, try and find ways to find the positives in something. Thank you for sharing this with us. I think that's a very inspirational how you managed to keep motivated and deal with all the emotions that you must have felt at that time. So kind of related to your current answer, how did you keep your morale up after facing any type of setbacks in your swimming career? Um, I think it's validating what you're feeling. You know, you're allowed to feel frustrated and disappointed if you are faced with a setback, but try not sit and dwell on it. Find an action plan or a way to find a solution and a way around it. Um, what my training and my career has taught me is I'm an individual that always thinks outside the box. You know, when a lot of people tend to go down the path that's maybe off to the right, I always find a way to go to the left. I, I quite enjoy being that little bit different. So when I'm faced with a setback, I always think, right, OK, what have I learned from this setback? You know, to make sure that a I don't hit that setback again or what tools do I need so that if I'm ever faced with this setback, I know how to plan and prepare it. So maybe the impact's not going to be as um, as strong or as heavy as it's feeling right now. Um, so there's lots of different things. Uh, as I mentioned, my dog, Poppy, um, she's been a great morale booster. She knows when to make me laugh. Um, she, I've been able to teach her some tricks, which has really helped me out. And it, again, it's just a nice little distraction. My partner as well, my friends have been great in just you know getting me out for a walk or you know meeting up on Zoom and just having a chat and you know, maybe being someone there that could listen so that if I am feeling like I'm struggling, that I can talk to somebody um, so that I don't feel like I'm having to suffer in silence or keep all these negative thoughts rolling around in my head, sometimes getting them out. Um, sometimes as well, maybe having a diary and writing it down, not always the best at keeping it. Sometimes a video diary was better for me to get what I was feeling off my chest. So know that you can validate how you're feeling in that moment, but making sure that you've got a plan to try and move forward. It was, Setbacks sometimes can be great opportunities in learning. So whilst it might not seem the nicest thing that's happened as a, for the setback, there's an opportunity for you to fig, learn while, why has this happened? What, you know, what path is this going to set me on now? Um, if everything went to plan and smoothly for all of us, life would be very boring. Um, you know, it's really important sometimes that these setbacks can define who you are as an individual because it's all about the choices that you make after the setback. So for me, I always had the mindset of, well, everything happens for a reason. You might not know what the reason is right now, but later on down the line, you'll sit back and think, ah, I'm on this path now because of that moment. So it's not panicking. It's allowing yourself to see that there is going to be a way around it might not be the way that you planned, but plans change, you know, be adaptive, be able to um, uh, find a way to be fluid with what's happening around you. Um, and if you're determined enough, you learn that you are quite a resilient individual when you're faced with setbacks. And that's another reason as well. When we're faced with setbacks, we actually learn how resilient we are as individuals. I mean, look at COVID. A lot of us, it was a really, really tough time, but every single one of us were incredibly resilient in what we had to go through. Each and every one of us have got our own stories. And, you know, sports taught me an awful lot about that and appreciating it and understanding it. So, yeah, definitely uh, realize that you are resilient and, um, you know, find the little things that make you happy. Poppy makes me happy. Movies make me happy. Songs like make me happy. Um, and, and just keep a hold of those. Those are really great morale boosters for you. So lots of different things you mentioned there. And I think it's very important that we all kind of um, take inspiration from you and make sure that we do um, understand how we're feeling and that we do take actions to help us feel more calm and at ease, even after facing difficult situations. So what do you think was the biggest hurdle that you overcame in your swimming career? Um, 
quite a few things. Uh, I guess my shoulder injury was possibly my biggest hurdle because I've never experienced anything like that before. I've had small little niggles, you know, little bits that I normally saw a physio for, but it would always get fixed. And this was the first time where it couldn't get fixed by my physio. Like they actually had to surgically fix it. And that would have taken me out of more training. I didn't know whether coming back from the surgery, if my shoulder was ever going to be the same again. Um, Because once, you know, surgery happens, you can get back to relative fitness, but sometimes people might lose range of movement or it might feel different. So I I really did struggle um, to try and come to terms with having this surgery, but I knew my long-term health, it might not have you know, helped maybe my career in swimming at that moment in time. But I had to think about the future and think about what my sort of future health would be like. And, you know, in order to remain uh, positive and happy and enjoy and, you know, like have good mental well-being as well, that surgery was really, really important to have. So overcoming that and coming to terms and accepting it was really, really tough and probably the toughest thing I've ever had to do. Um, You know, I used to think, oh, you know, 10, 400 IMs off like, six minutes was the toughest thing ever or waking up at half past four in the morning was really really tough but the older you get and the more you experience the more you realize that those little things might have been you know a big deal at the time but actually you know you're a lot stronger and you can overcome them but yeah definitely my shoulder surgery was probably the biggest hurdle I've ever had to face and potentially as well um coming to terms with my retirement too uh, that was quite a big hurdle too because it's swimming's been such a big part of my life for so long and I've loved it it's my routine it's my life I've been known for being a swimmer so to walk away I've not fully walked away I still get in for an odd swim every now and then but to know that I'm never going to compete at that high level and at Olympics again it was hard mentally as well it was quite hard to accept but you know I'm going through the process of it I have good days I have bad days Uh, and I guess this at the moment has been my current hurdle that you know has been challenging but probably not as hard as my my shoulder uh, surgery. That's so cool that you've managed to understand so much from your experiences and I think you've been very brave honestly. So throughout your swimming career your only coach as you've been mentioning has been your dad. So how did you manage to find a balance between training and relaxing at home? (laughs) So I have a huge amount of respect for my dad. He was um, involved in swimming long before I came along and has a huge passion and drive. And I do owe a lot to him. I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in now had it not been for him. Um, You know, he was the first one that chucked me in a pool and got me swimming. And I kind of enjoyed the journey that we've had together. But he wasn't a full time coach when I was growing up. He was a a helicopter pilot. That was his full time profession. Um, He was only a volunteer swimming coach. So. I'm quite a literal person. Um, I'm very good at doing what I'm told. And that's just my personality type. I'll tell you a funny little story. When I was very young, we had like a little party at our house. I had people over and we had a cat, a really fluffy cat called Bruce. And if you have a cat, you kind of know they've got this habit of, you know, dipping tails and paws in your food that you don't really want them to do that. And he was doing that. And all the guests drink and food. He was dipping his big feather, feather duster type tail across all the food. And I think I was only like three or four years old at the time. And my dad was getting really frustrated with Bruce. And he was like, Hannah, can you just kick the cat out? So I kind of toddle over to Bruce, pick him up. And he's quite a big cat. And I take him to the back door uh, in the kitchen and you put Bruce down. And he's kind of looking at me going, oh, am I going outside? I open the back door. And as I open the back door, my right leg swings back. And then as I bring it forward, I make contact with Bruce. And poor Bruce ends up being booted literally out the back door. And... um I got into a lot of trouble for that because obviously you don't kick animals, but I was literally told to kick the cat out. A phrase that is, you know, you know, it's just take the cat outside, but three, four year old me took it very, very literal. So my dad knew that, you know, being able to coach me, I think would be quite easy because I will just do what I'm told. But um, because he was a helicopter pilot as well, he wasn't always there. He would leave some of the training sessions on the kitchen counter that I would then take to the swimming pool and I would give it to the uh, parent helper there at the time who would write it out and I would communicate via text when he was you know on an oil uh, oil platform uh, in the North Sea and basically say yeah that session felt great or nah, that session felt pants you know I was really really struggling today or I didn't like that or I like that so he was always looking for feedback and I think that ability to trust that I would not change the set and make it easier 
that I would also provide feedback. You know, I trusted him to listen to my feedback as well. So our relationship kind of grew and developed around there. Um, it was difficult sometimes to be able to have that switch off point um, because he was very, very invested in swimming. So he would take swimming home. Uh, and especially if he'd been flying all day, he'd want to know a bit more in person how the training session went. He would try and plan the next couple of days of training, especially if he knew he was going to be offshore a lot more. Um, so it was sometimes a little bit difficult to switch it off. But um, that was where my mom was really good. She was kind of like um, our sort of ultimate team manager. She kind of knew when to be like, right, let's have a break from swimming. Let's just chill out and watch you know, X Factor or Britain's Got Talent on TV or, you know, have family time. So um, so that kind of gave our dynamic, uh, you know, a nice balance. Didn't always get it right. And, you know, we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect in it. But it worked for us. And whether it could work for another family, I don't know. Who knows? But, you know, our family made it work. And I wouldn't and I totally appreciate everything that my dad has done. And he's learned a lot from me as much as I learned a lot from him. When I hit my teenage years, um, there was no chance I was ever going to win an argument uh, with him regarding swimming because he was involved in a lot of Olympic swimmers um, when I was, you know, quite small. So, yeah, he knew more about swimming than I did. So, again, I had a huge amount of respect for him on that. So, yeah, arguing with him was just a non-starter. And I think from that, that respect as well, uh, I think was really key to our relationship. And a lot of people ask, you know, why, why stay with your dad? Why not go to another coach? But to be honest, you know, why, why try and fix something that's not broke? For me, it was working. I'm with somebody who knows exactly what I need, who knows who I am. He knows how to handle me when I have mood swings or if I'm having a good day or a bad day. Um, he was able to provide me with the best bespoke training possible. Um, and he taught me, you know, a, a lot of my personality traits. I've got Irish heritage. So he's always saying about be the last man standing, fighting Irish, you know, really deep, dig deep into your Celtic roots. And um, yeah, I owe a lot to him, which is which is awesome. And it's just nice to be able to take him on that journey because my family did have to sacrifice an awful lot for swimming. It's a very unforgiving sport. Um, and my two younger brothers as well were great uh, training partners. And again, you know, they kind of had to cope and put up with being at competitions, uh, you know, every weekend. So it was a family work ethic that we had um, and making sure that we made time for family time was really important because, again, it was that switch off point. That one time that we didn't have to think about swimming. And um, I have my mom to thank for that because I think that really made the dynamic work at its best. That's brilliant to hear. And it's quite heartwarming to see how much effort that everyone in your family put in to help bring you to your position. So after 17 years of, you know, competitive swimming, you have officially retired. But as you mentioned earlier, you are quite keen to continue swimming. So what do you think your plans are currently for the future? Um, I'm still kind of currently figuring things out, but it's um, it's been quite exciting. I'll still have an input in swimming. It's a sport that I've been doing for so long and is technically, I guess, my best degree. Um, I do have a degree in sport and exercise science. So I think staying in the health and fitness industry, I think would be really key. I love body movement. Um, I qualified as a Pilates teacher as well. So again, kind of my quirky out the box thinking. I love trying to find ways to help strengthen the body and the mind through exercise. Um, you know, you can take part in sport, but you don't have to be an elite athlete. You know, sport is for everyone, no matter what age or stage that you're at and no matter what sport it is, you know, Everyone has the ability and the chance to do it for themselves. So I'd like to try and help advocate that. I'm also working on a couple of projects surrounding female health um, and trying to help spread education and open the conversation. It's probably one of the last taboos in sport, talking about female menstruation. And there's a lot of unlocked and untapped potential that us females, you know, can really delve into and hopefully allow us to have a better, better experience um, in sport and, you know, hopefully help improve our quality of life and well-being if we can fully understand what's happening with our bodies and what we can do to help manage it so that, A, we can spot maybe some red flags that can help protect us, you know, from future health damage. We can act on it when those red flags crop up find out what is normal for us and um and yeah just be able to you know not be held back by our hormones um so I'm really excited about where that's going to go and yeah just kind of figuring, figuring out where I fit in in the world you've mentioned a lot lots of different things that you learned throughout your swimming career you know you encountered the box quite a lot 
and the importance of positivity and listening to your body. But what do you think is the main thing that you've learned from your swimming career? Um, I think self-belief, um, knowing that you are good enough. Um, and it's something that I probably need to say more to myself now. But, you know, we are resilient individuals and it all comes down to the choices that we make. We have more control of what we want to do and what we want to achieve. It just comes down to those decisions. So not being afraid to make some big decisions, um, knowing that we are good enough and we're a lot stronger than I think we think we are. Um, so, you know, taking stock on that. Um, yeah, there's loads of things. I can't really say just one thing that I've learned. <laughs> As you can tell from all my other answers, there's a lot in there. And self-reflection has been really important for that, to realize some of those life lessons and actually just realize how far I've come through uh, through all of that. You know, it's funny to think that, you know, I was a little six year old desperately trying to swim butterfly in an inverary swimming pool. 25 meters making it to the wall and finishing with my face rather than my hands and you know that was my first big lesson there finish with your hands not your face um and the lessons just started you know going from there but it's been a really really fun journey and you know it's not over yet there's still a lot more to come but certainly the experiences that I've been lucky enough to have by getting to an Olympic Games and Commonwealth and being part of some great teams um has set me up for you know some great stories to tell but also some great, great life experiences that's, you know, um, taught me an awful lot, as I say, resiliency, trying to be organized, although I think my mum would still cringe because my room was always a mess, and it still kind of is, but it's an organized mess. I know where everything is, just not necessarily in a neat and tidy order, but, um, you know, being organized and planning, you know, competition schedules, trying to ba balance schoolwork and homework, so you know, that can come into play and working as a team, you know, trusting your teammates, trusting your coach, communication. There are, the list is endless with what I've learned. Um, and I'm afraid I can only give you a small snapshot because otherwise we'd be here for hours. <laughs> no, you sound very, very passionate. And it was really nice to hear from you today. So thank you very much, Hannah, for a really, really inspiring interview. And thank you everyone else for listening. Tune in to more episodes from Tech Fest Talks. Thank you once again. Bye for now.